How's it going, Om? It's going good, Alec. Thanks for coming back again. Yeah, this is a beautiful morning out here on the acre. Um, tell me a little bit more about you know where we're seated and then a little bit about that beautiful meadow behind you. Okay, cool. Well, we're at Ohm's Acre. It's just outside of Phoenixville in Pennsylvania. It's in the uh, northern Piedmont region. Um, it's an eco-region that um, extends primarily from south to north in this area. And it's um, actually close to Valley Forge. And the meadow behind me, we're sort of on the north part of the property. And the lower part of the property, the property sort of slopes up gently upwards. And, you know, this is kind of where it all began for our little journey. And the meadow is kind of the, the crown jewel of the property, if you will. <laughs> um, where did the idea come from? So I think like most people, we were, at least I was, um, I was really into the lawn and growing the lawn, having that perfect manicured lawn. And... Um, so one day I put this lawn in when we first bought the house. It was a, it was a blank um, piece of land. There was, it was just all dirt. You could do whatever you want. It was a blank canvas. And I wanted to put the lawn in thinking that's what I wanted to do because it was bigger. And, you know, it'd be really cool to see it all manicured. And, and uh, you know, we had a hot, arid summer and I lost the lawn. And I looked around and said, wow, that was a lot of work. And I just don't want to do that again. And so... Simultaneously, um, I stumbled upon native plants and I just started diving in a little bit deeper and deeper and learning more about how beneficial the native plants are to you know, your property, but not only your property, but everything else around you. Bringing in um, animals and, and uh, reptiles and pollinators and all kinds of stuff. And not only that, it helps um, break up the poor quality of the soil that we have. And it just made sense, and we sort of went on it from there. Okay. What are, like, the first steps that we should take if they decide that you know, they have such a beautiful meadow from their property? It's a, that's a great question, because I think everybody would answer it a little differently. And the perspective that we come from is our perspective it what we do may not work for the person two states over or even an eco region up north or, or whatever or south but this is our perspective this is what worked for us and so um, the first thing we did was we really had to figure out what our eco region was like where are we and you know in the beginning it was more broad it was kind of like looking at the northeastern United States. And I didn't know any better at the time, but I thought that was a great place to start. So we went into it with thinking like, okay, well, this is our eco region and this is what plants will thrive in this area. And so, like I said, we used that level three eco region of the northeast. So we started researching, okay, what plant will do here? What plant can do that? Blah, 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 and all that from there. And it sort of just, started to get deeper and deeper and deeper and now four years later i've learned that being in the northeast and looking at it in such a broad area is still too large of a spectrum because plants that might thrive up in maine may not thrive down in this area so we've actually taken it to the point where we're creating more of sort of what's called a level four ecosystem and that's as minute and as detailed as you can get and level four would be our little microclimate this valley forge area looking around and walking through valley forge oh this thrives in valley forge you know we're very close to that so it'll thrive on our property and so that was the first step it's just getting to know like your little microclimate and what that microclimate can handle in your area so it sounds like get as specific as possible to pinpoint your geographic area. Yeah, we we feel like that's that's the best way to go. Yeah. You don't have to. Listen, the stuff in New York is doing fine here, and lots of the stuff when we were doing the level three northeast, a lot of what you see is northeast, so it's doing fine. 
Um, I just think the truest, most deepest sense of if you're trying to accomplish this, then you would go to the deepest truth that you could find. And that for us was um, learning what level four meant. Yeah, because it sounds like, you know, traditional landscaping, gardening, right? People decide what they want to put around their property. Absolutely. And the landscaper helps them. And so lots of things that, you know, a traditional landscaper would bring in and no offense to anybody, but um, they might be bringing this stuff in that is from China. And the problem with stuff like that is, yes, it can still grow here. But again, part of the point was to bring in pollinators and animals and stuff like that. And so when something comes in from, you know, halfway across the world, these little insects that have been living here in our area forever are kind of like, well, what do you want me to do with that? Like, I don't even know what it is. You're trying to tell me that you're bringing in plants from a different um, country. And I have no idea what to do with it. You know, I need this nectar. I need this food. So can you bring in stuff that's a little bit more native to your geographical area? So basically, the, the key thing is to let nature kind of tell you what to plant. Yeah. Based on more specific people. Absolutely, absolutely. And and the easiest way to do that is just to look around. What is growing in your area already? And then you can see what's going to thrive in your area. And all the pollinators and the insects and the animals and the reptiles, they'll thrive because they're in that area. And now you're bringing in the flora, the native flora from that area. So let's say, you know, I want to build a meadow. I know what plants to put in there, what do I do next? So, okay, so what we did was we defined our geographic area and then, um, then we started just researching, you know, what plants do better in the shade, what do better in the full sun. We also did a soil test to see what our soil was like. We had brand new construction here. Um, so heavy machinery was all over the property and it really compacted a very heavy clay soil already and it got it tighter and tighter and tighter. So for us, the next step was then to kill the existing vegetation, which was kind of easy because the grass had already failed. So we had a lot of bare spots that we didn't have to smother out. We just had to watch out with the invasives that were starting to pop in and, and try and take care of those types of invasives. So smothering your area or preparing your area and knowing the measurements of what you're going to throw down um, on your property or how big your acre is going to be, or I'm sorry, how big your meadow is going to be was really important for the planning phase. Okay. And so how do you actually go about starting to plant? Do you throw all the plants down at once? Do you sort of do it gradually? So, do you prep the area? Yeah, so that's a great question. So what, what we did next was then we prepped the area. And again, we had lost a lot of the... Um, the uh, cold season grasses, they were all dying. So because it was so compact and a little controversial, I actually tilled the soil down about a half inch because that's how compact it was. And I researched it and you should do it this way, you should do it that way. And I said, you know what, I'm gonna try and do it the way that I feel instinctually about doing it. And I tilled it down about a half inch, very lightly, didn't really mix it up too much. And then I, added a little bit of um, some topsoil in just to kind of get it a little bit more manageable because it really was like cement. The, the, it was really a hard surface. So prepping the area for us meant um, bringing in the rototiller and breaking up the clay a little bit. Now native plants in the long run will do that for you because the root systems can get very, very deep, but we're starting at the very beginning and thought that was the way to go. Any other, um, I guess, put it this way, what did you not expect to come up? Were there any challenges? Or yeah, difficult? yeah, so disturbing the soil is what we learned happens. So if you disturb the soil, you're disturbing the seed bank that's been there forever. And what's going to happen then is you're going to start to bring up a lot of undesirable 
weeds or invasive species that you might not want. And the thing is, is a weed is a weed, whatever, that can be beautiful in its own way, but if it starts to take over your property, well, then it's going to be counterproductive because what you're planting will end up being smothered out by an invasive. You know, and there's plenty of invasives everywhere. So um, we brought up a lot of invasive species that was growing alongside the meadow the first year. And there was maintenance that we had to take care of as a result. All right, um, so we talked about all the stages up till preparation. So let's say we prepped the soil and now we are ready to get started yeah. with our meadow. What do we do next? Okay, so it's a little bit of a waiting game and we started the project in, I would say fall. That's when we started to really smother things out and notice that the vegetation was now gone and it was just dirt. So we didn't want to just have dirt for the winter, obviously because of erosion and um, we just didn't want to have bare soil. So the next step is we selected the seeds that we wanted to bring in and, and we used a seed mix from um, Ernst Seeds out, I believe it's in uh, near Erie, Pennsylvania, a local company for us um, within the state. And you know, we consulted with them, talked to them a lot and asked lots of questions and, and finally decided on which seeds. But along with that, we planted a cover crop and we used oats. And the oats were gonna help secure the soil, keep everything in place so we wouldn't have any erosion just in case there was lots of rain through the fall and you know into the early spring and so we planted the oats and we threw down the the uh, first round of the seeds and the seeds included um, the native grasses like the little blue stems uh, lots of rutabecchia um, other types of grasses like side oats grandma um, we had asters that were in there. We have all kinds of echinacea that was in there. I mean, you name it, there was a lot, maybe 15 to 20 different types of species. Gotcha. Okay. So we did that and um, then we let the winter go by and we let it, we let the oats grow up and they grew up really nicely. They got, you know, not, not tremendously high, they maybe got up to I don't know, maybe, I guess, uh, two feet, something like that. And then when the spring came along, what we did was we mowed down the oats and we threw down a little bit more of the seed mix. And now, um, from that point, we didn't do much more after that. We didn't, we didn't um, water it in. I did it a little bit at first. and. Then I kind of looked at the situation and said, well, let, let nature do what it's going to do. So we stopped watering it. And little by little, we started to get uh, a lot of vegetation. And in that first year, we got a tremendous amount of partridge pea. And it was this beautiful sea of yellow. And, and, and it was so much yellow that we're like, wow, that's a lot of yellow. And it was cool. And, I, and secretly, I was hoping that there'd be more color. And I didn't know because it was the first year. And that's all we really got that first year was partridge pea and rutabecchia. They're a really great year, um, first year impacting types of natives that you can put in. If you want to see something immediately, those are the type of things you, and it occupies the space and um, keeps the soil from drying out. So we did that in the spring and we kind of let that go through that whole first summer. We didn't mow it at all the first year. We just kept it, let it grow. And, there were lots of invasives then coming up and that's when we started hand picking. We didn't spray it again. We started hand picking everything and just pulling out what we thought were the invasives. So a little bit of echinacea started popping in, not much. That takes a little bit more time to grow. But then at the end of the first year, we saw a, a really nice result in a sea of yellow. Now, after that, you know, the winter came and we kept the seeds I'm sorry, we kept the plants active and up. We didn't cut them back. We let them sit over the winter and that's when we noticed a lot more of the animals starting to come in. And 
the animals were feeding off of the seeds, the birds, and they were also using all of the meadow for places to hide. And it was really cool because we, we would see hawks coming in to, to look for birds, and we'd see all kinds of small little animals scurrying through. And then the following spring, what we did was, once we had a solid week of 70 degree weather, weather we, we cut back the meadow for the first time and then it stimulated the process and we started to see more different types of species coming out. It wasn't now just the partridge pea and the rutabecchia. We started to see butterfly weed coming out. We started to see the uh, blue mist flowers starting to come out. Well, actually the blue mist was a little bit more towards the end of the summer, but we started to see a lot of different species coming out. Again, we didn't do much. There wasn't a tremendous amount of, of invasives that were coming in. We'd pull some stilt grass here. We'd pull some of the, um, uh, I forget the name of the, the uh, thing, the algae um, plant that makes you sneeze all the time, but we'd pull that type of stuff out and we would kind of let it do what it wanted to do on its own. And that's sort of the story of what would happen. And so every fall, um, we would let it go in, in through the winter. We'd, we'd, we'd let the meadow do what it wants to do and um, hand prune out the things that we didn't want in there and cut it back in the springtime each year. And from there, now we have a third year meadow that's, that's absolutely thriving. And the coolest thing about it is what you see in the spring isn't what you get in the fall like the spring was lots of yellows and it was gorgeous and it was just popping and it was amazing i'm like we were so happy with it and then you know as the summer came in and it got a little bit more dry i could see all the asters starting to pop up with no color but I, I knew that those were asters and now we have this sea of purple mixed in with the yellow of the golden rods and it really is a, a, a gorgeous thing to kind of just look at and to know that everything is thriving around it. And that was sort of like the little journey of, of what happens and, you know, the step-by-step -step process that, that we use to, to get it going and to, to be able to maintain it. Um, I guess I understood that it takes about seven years for the meadow to really settle in for what it's going to be year after year. I don't know if that's true or not, but it seems to evolve every year and change every year. And, um, Right now is you see what you get and, and it's it's really magical. Well I appreciate all the information on anything else you'd like to add or maybe we'll just see in the next video. Yeah, so um, there's a lot that, that that goes into it and what we've learned is that there's a passion that comes along with what you're doing and you know within that passion there is more of this I guess this internal wanting to create something that's going to be more beneficial, not, not for you. Once you look outside of just what you want, you see the bigger picture of adding in stuff and plants and species and trees that benefit everything around you. And that, that's what brings the joy to us to, to look out here and see a deer or a fox or to uncover the log and see a snake. And it's really neat to kind of see how everything works together and how everything flows together. And, um, you know, we, we, we marvel at it every day and, and love where we live and love to see all of those elements come together and, and to create a nice ecosystem that's beneficial, not just for us, but for everybody in this area. Yeah, absolutely. See you next one. All right, man. Thank you. Take care.